Let's jump in and let's talk about man is made in the image of God. We talk about that. Let's pick that one. Man is made in the image of God. So man has the characteristics or the image of God. That's, that's an amazing statement just right there. Man is made in God's image. What are those characteristics? Let's, let's look at the context. Remember we do our inductive Bible study. Let's turn to Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Let's look where the word image is used and the word, uh, what does the word mean and then how is that developed in its context. So that's how we can draw a theology. Uh, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Talas is the word for image. And it's the same word that, that is used in 1 Samuel 6, 5. Therefore you shall make an image of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. So here is in 1 Samuel 6, 5, we have a direct uh, example of how image is used. You make an image of the rats. It was an exact replica of the rats, an image. It wasn't obviously the same thing. It, it represented it. It stood in representation of the rats. And it had a, an, an essential uh, quality that corresponded to the rats. That was, that, that was the image. So if you looked at the image, you could say, ah, oh, it looks like a rat, only it's made in the image of a rat. It's not an actual rat. So that's the typical word for image, right? It's, it's, a, it's a normal use of the word image. So think about God calling us people made in His image. That's phenomenal, isn't it? So there's something about us that corresponds to God, that is in God's likeness, that we, we represent God on earth, that there's, there's things that are, are, are in our nature that are patterned after God. So God made man in his image. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. So the, the expression of this image is a function. Dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So both, both men and women, male and female, are both made in the image of God. There's no, there's no distinction when, in relation to the, the nature of man, man, male or female. There's no lessening of God's image with the male or with the female. They're, they're equally made in God's image. Then God blessed them and said, to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I've given you every green herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which, is, in which there is life. I've given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we see three things that, that from this context that develop the meaning of image. So there's a, there's a replication, there's a, a correspondence between the likeness of God and the likeness of man. So man carries out an, an aspect of God on earth. Remember, always being distinct from God and always being a creature of God, a creation of God. So it never touches and, and blurs the, the creation-creator distinction. Although that's what Satan's going to tempt them with, isn't it? You'll be like God. But for the image, the image does not make man God. He's like God. Just like a, an image of a rat is not a rat. A rat is very different than an image, right? So God is very different than us, but there is a correspondence. There's, there's that which is like God. And so I think three things from this context, we see that, that God gives 
man, and I'm using man to mean male and female, God gives man moral authority. And that was the moral authority to have dominion. Dominion is an aspect of God's rule. God's, God is the one who rules. God is sovereign. So to be God, you're sovereign, right? Well, God makes man in his image and he gives man a work to do that's like his work. So it's kind of like God's work. We get to rule over creation, right? Rule over the earth. Only our rule is in submission to his rule. God rules the universe under the direction of his will. We rule under the, under the direction of his will. We rule in submission to him. So this, the dominion mandate really is God giving man as his image bearers the moral authority to represent God on the earth. That is the moral authority as stewards of God. So God gives the command. God tells what to do, where to go, how to do it. God, in a sense, draws the lines. Do this, don't do this. But he's given man, male, male and female, the moral authority to exercise this oversight over creation. It would be like a small L, this lordship, which again corresponds to the lordship of God. <coughs> we find in Psalm 8, if we turn there, Psalm 8 is a, a good psalm that, that celebrates this. Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength, because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? So maybe tonight on this windy October night, go outside and look up at the stars and ask God this question. What is man that you are mindful of him? Consider the creation, verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, <coughs> the moon, the stars, look at the greatness of God's creation. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him. For if you made him a little lower than the angels, you have covered him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Just like Jesus Christ is Lord and all things are under his feet, so an aspect of man's image is that we are like God in the sense that God has given us dominion and placed things under our feet so that we would be good stewards of that which God has given us. That's dominion. This is what sets Christianity apart. The Judeo-Christian uh, work ethic comes right from Genesis 1. And it is, it is really the, the, what sets it apart from the, the pagan notion that we are all one with the God. We're all one with creation, that pantheistic idea of, of monism that we're all one. No, there's God. God is separate than creation. He's the creator. He acts upon creation to make it, but he makes man special and unique. So man is in a special and unique place as a image bearer, as one who represents God, as one who has a God-like function on the earth. As God is Lord, capital L, so we are lowercase l, and God has put things under our feet. And he's given man the moral authority to rule over those. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep, all oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. So, so the difference is, our stewardship, we praise God for. Lord, thank you for the stewardship, for the moral authority that you have given me, us, man, to steward in harmony with your will the creation that you have made. That's a major aspect of what, it is, of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. And again, as because we are under God's authority, we as stewards will give an account to God. The second thing is blessing. 
we see that in, a very, in the very beginning, in the context of talking about the image of God, God blesses those made in, Im in His image. Then God blessed them and, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over. So this blessing entails a moral responsibility. There's a moral responsibility. And I would develop that from the passage, Genesis 1, and going forward into Genesis. Genesis is all about the blessing. And we see that the blessing can be given, and we see that the blessing can be lost. So there is a moral responsibility to keep this blessing, to walk with God. Okay, Adam and Eve were created. They were uh, walking with God in the cool of the day in a place of blessing. But the other side of blessing is a curse. And if you lose the blessing through disobedience, there is a curse. So, that's, so, so the blessing and the curse is moral language. That's my point here. So there's a moral responsibility. Man is morally responsible to know God and to walk after God in his ways. Blessing implies a moral responsibility. So all men have a moral authority as stewards of God. All men have a moral responsibility to walk with God as image bearers of God. And number three, number three, all men have a responsibility to be rational. All men have a responsibility to be rational. And when I say rational, what I mean is this. God said to them, rational beings. Man made in God's image is a rational being. That is, God can speak to man and men understand what God has said. He has an intellect. He has a mind that can hear concepts and understand them. You know, you speak to your dog about ad abstract concepts. The dog can know its name and, and maybe the pitch of your voice and maybe a couple other things. And that's about it. It's very, very limited compared to man made in God's image who has the gift of language. Right? You can speak to your cat and it will understand a thing. Cats don't want to. You can, under you can talk to the animals. And, right? Where man made in God's image, God uses propositional revelation, and God speaks to them. What does this tell us about man? It tells us that man is made with the capacity to understand language, to understand logical thought. God says this, then God says this, right? Think of the context of Genesis. God did this, then he did this, then he did this, then he did this. Sequential, time-oriented, time frame, right? We just naturally pick that up. Why? Because we're created to be rational beings. We're not created to be irrational beings. We actually have a moral responsibility to stay rational, <laughs> to be rational. Why? Because God is rational. In the sense that God is simple, He's orderly, He's not chaotic, right? God does this, then God does this, then God does this, in how He walks out His plan for history. Now, we know God is outside of time. He's eternal. But that doesn't mean God is illogical or irrational. So man has a moral responsibility to understand what God has said. So those are three very important aspects for what it means to be made in the image of God. These are characteristics of image. They're, they're a result of, because God made man like himself. He carries a lordship aspect in his stewardship over creation. Because God made man in his image, he carries a moral responsibility to carry out the blessings. And if he, if he messes that up, cursing. There's a moral responsibility. Just like God is holy and all of creation depends upon the, the moral character of God. Now God is immutable. He doesn't change, right? But in a, in a lesser sense, as image bearers, we are morally responsible and we bear that responsibility. Uh, and what drives that moral responsibility or defines that is this whole idea of, of rational beings who can speak and understand words and concepts of reason and logic and most of all, well, or, or I should say primarily, 
revelation. We can understand the words that come from the heart of God. <laughs> God speaks. And, and this idea of God speaking and man understanding is absolutely foundational to what it means to be an image bearer of God. And you see what happens, one of the first things that goes when, when men lose their rational mind is that they don't believe in logic, they don't believe in the rules of grammar and, and language. And that's postmodernism. Postmodernism is the new hermeneutic that words do not communicate objective meaning. Words just communicate uh, an, a, an impression. And really what matters most is how you interpret it because everybody has their own interpretation. So the meaning is only as good as how it's, how it's true for you. So I can say, in the beginning God created. Well, what does that mean for you? Then you take that and make your own truth and that's what your truth is. <laughs> and it, it destroys... Logic, and we can see living in postmodern America where this illogical thinking goes, right? There's hundreds of ex examples. Someone give me one example where illogical thinking is becoming more prominent and accepted. Give me one example from this week. <laughs> it doesn't have to be from this week, Phil. That's <laughs> too hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're all around us. Give me an example. One example. Oh, one today was uh, apparently it's becoming more accepted for, for women to be preachers. Oh, yeah. Right. And, um, and uh, even some of the more conservative groups are now bending... That's a hot topic, isn't it? Bending the knee to that. From what MacArthur said, that statement. Yeah. It's all over, yeah. Where Scripture is clear. I do not permit a woman to speak or have authority over a man. Mm -hmm. There's no... You know, elders are men. Elders that pastor are men. There's, the language of Scripture is clear. It's not about the language of Scripture. It's about how that makes you feel. That's right. I mean, even Al Mohler, you know, had said in May that, that women were not to be preachers or elders. Right. You know, so, kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Scripture's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. But you have people saying, well, I wasn't called to, you know, serve men. I was called by God to do this. So... So, and that statement was floating around. And when I heard that, I thought, okay, so we're putting, again, our, our subjective feelings above the Word of God. That's what, that's what that goes, right? Which is, it's irrational, it's illogical, and it redefines the Scriptures. If, if all you had was the Bible to address that question, you'd come down pretty clearly on, women are not elders. Elders sh shepherding pastors, right? They can do a lot of things. A lot, right? Yeah. They can speak the gospel. They can make disciples. They can uh, do a lot of ministry. Very important ministry, right? They're not devalued at all. They're just not elders. In other words, women aren't men, right? Women aren't men. And guess what? Men aren't women. And is that not the issue of confusion today? And it all goes back to how we understand logic and reason and most of all, revelation. And all those go together. How we understand revelation? Because revelation, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. And if you deny the beginning of wisdom, you can go anywhere. But when you go, come to the God, the personal God who speaks, who gives His Word, then you understand that you're actually, you're actually knowing the God of the Bible. Okay, good example. There's the other one I found was the insistence on acceptance of perversion. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, like it's, it's rampant through the whole country, through the whole world. Yeah. E exactly. That's a rational debate. So with as and that's another good example. It's exactly it doesn't make sense. Right. Man has authority to have dominion. He has a moral responsibility to walk with God and he has a rational mind to understand God that we can know the truth and the truth will set you free, Jesus said. We can know the truth. When Pilate said, "What is truth?" Jesus said, I am the truth. He said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And people say, what is truth? And agnosticism, and I don't know. And it's, this is the truth. So we can know this truth. We are made to know the, the truth as image bearers of God. And when we reject the truth, when we reject the stewardship, when we reject the responsibility to walk in God's ways, then we become less than what God has intended. Um, 
Here's another example of what it means to be in the image of God. So let's, let's turn the page. That's Genesis 1, develop that context. Let's look at Genesis 2.15. You, you, you see these concepts played out all throughout the scriptures. Uh, Genesis 2.15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. So again, we see here that God gave the command to have dominion and God prepared the place, the setting, for man to have dominion. Authority for dominion as steward. God puts him in the garden to tend it and to keep it. I mean, I know this is basic, but the, just the thought of, of God speaking to man, right? Remember when Nebuchadnezzar was after this, his wise men to try to get them to understand the dream. And they confess, well, the dwelling of, of God is not with man. <laughs> In other words, we have no communication with God, with the gods. And Nebuchadnezzar, well, what am I paying you for, right? What am I paying you for? Well, we know God because he's spoken. And he took the man, he put him in the garden, he gave him the context to work, and he commanded the man. He has a responsibility to obey. So remember, the Bible has the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man side by side without any need to reconcile them. Why? Because God is completely sovereign in the infinite. Man is sovereign in the finite place where God set him. So man was responsible. He was made of a responsible agent and he puts him in the garden. He gives him a, a command and it says, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Do this, but don't do this. So we see how that was expected. God expected the man to understand that and to obey that. Right? Jimmy, go clean your room. You're expected to understand that and obey that. But do you ever give your parents pushback? You never give your parents pushback. Okay, who of you is told to go clean your room and you give your parents pushback on that? Thank you, honest people, thank you. Uh, now, uh, now, why do you give pushback? Because he's married. What do you mean? Huh? I get, what do you mean? Do you understand? I didn't know you, I didn't know what you meant. I didn't know you meant clean like all the room. <laughs> How about this? Go fold the laundry. Go do your schoolwork. Right? Huh? You said <laughs> These are clear commands. And it's understood that we have the responsibility to obey. And if he obeyed, he would live in the state that he existed. This is back to Adam now. My point is that man has the responsibility to do what God has said. And we know that to be true. We're made, we're programmed to be made in the image of God, to understand that he is God with clear words so that we can actually know who he is and we are, we are placed under authority as his rulers on earth to carry out his command. This is the state that Adam and Eve found themselves in. What state was that in? A good one, right? They were in a good one. Uh, God says it right there at the end of Genesis 1, it was Tov Mahov. Everything God made was very good. They were in a, some theologians say it was a state of innocence, a state of righteousness, right? I like the idea it was untested righteousness. But the point is God made them good. Why is that so important? Gives us a baseline. Gives us a baseline. For what? It's foundational for what is good and mm -hmm. what is not good. Right. Or, you know, any variant of mm -hmm. that. That's how we, how we were originally reflecting God's image. That's right. Right. And because God is good, God made good stuff. He didn't put us in a place of neutrality. He didn't put us in, a, in an evil place. God does not make... Uh, God is not the designer, author of evil, although God uses evil. And that's a can be a, an interesting discussion, right? But God put them in a good place, as a good God would. Now, they didn't remain in there, but that's 
where they were in a place of works in the sense that if they did what God said in a place of works, they would maintain and be in that good place. As a rational man, Adam understood what God said. He understood what his ways were. He understood that if he didn't do this, that he would die. So this obedience of believing what God said, keeping what God said, God said from the beginning is an issue of life and death. So your life depends upon being a good steward, being, a, being morally responsible, and learning the communication that God has and living by it. That's a matter of life and death. If you don't want to take dominion, you're not going to have any food to eat, right? If you don't want to be morally responsible, you're going to die. If you're not going to have wisdom and learn of God's word. So obedience is a life and death issue. Understanding these things is the heart of man. So let's, so everyone, everyone see that from the very beginning, this is how God opens up history. Let's understand a little bit more about the heart of man. If you read Grudem, as do many other theologians, this is where they talk about trichotomy versus dichotomy. What is trichotomy? It's a body and a soul and a spirit. Right. The man is a body. It's, it's, what is the nature of man? What is man made of? Is he, is he a body? a soul and a spirit, which each one being distinct, or a dichotomy, which there's the body, soul, spirit. So there's a, a big debate. There has been a big debate about that. Some of the overflow or implications of that debate is significant. You can read about that all in Grudem. He does a great job of arguing against trichotomy for a dichotomy position. Uh, my, my position, or the way I like to say it, is, is that man is material and immaterial. He is material, that man is physical, and he's immaterial. And in the word immaterial, you have body, I'm sorry, you have spirit, and soul, and heart, and all of these <coughs> other words that Scripture uses. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Any diehard trichotomists here? Uh, you know, division of the soul and spirit. So there must be a difference between the soul and the spirit. And it, it kind of builds a theology of, you know, my, I have a resurrected spirit, but my soul has not been yet sanctified. And, and I, I, I did talk to a guy who was in D.C., and he believed firmly that his spirit was without sin. And, and he had a whole theology based on a trichotomy understanding. So there are theologians that have gone that way. He was a disciple of Watchman Nee, and he believed in a... a it, was, it was a mystical... It was, it was mixed with mysticism, but he believed that he could be uh, in, in a place of sinless perfection in his spirit, a resurrected spirit, but yet his body was, was not there. And so it, gets, it can get kind of confusing. And, and what ends up happening is you, you devalue something, right? You devalue the body or you exalt the body or, you know, where I think it's way better just to understand this body is important, right? The physical is important. We don't believe in a Gnostic gospel or a Neoplatonic kind of way of understanding that the spiritual is, is, is more important than the physical. No. The spiritual is very important, but that doesn't mean the physical is unimportant, right? God, God's will is that we serve Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength, all of us. The heart of man, let's talk about the unity of man, because I, I want to impress upon you the unity of man. God wants all of you. He wants your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, your body. Sanctify your body, right? Crucify uh, it's lust. Your, your soul can be defiled. The spirit can be defiled. There's scripture that speak of each of these. When we are cleansed, we come to God, all of us, our, our physical and our, and our uh, immaterial part, material and non-material, that we are a unity. We're not, a, we're not all chopped up in that way. Scripture can address certain aspects of who man is, but man is a unified essence.